that we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So as they uh, returned home from church, there were these two little girls who were discussing what they had learned in Sunday school. The older one was telling her sister the story of Queen Esther. The younger girl loved the story but couldn't understand why Esther was afraid to approach the king. Her sister thought for a moment and then confidently replied, well, it's not like it is now. Back in those days, men were important. Oh. oh. I thought that would get a bigger chuckle than it did. So, anyway, back then, some men were important, like kings. And we were talking in the last few weeks about a man named Saul, who is going to be the first king of Israel. And we've been going through this story of how he has been chosen. And one of the things that keeps striking me about this as we're reading the story, as we continue the story today, is, is that at no time does anybody say to Saul, would you like to be king? Is this something that you have a dream about? I mean, is there something, is there, is there really desire for that to happen in your life? And, and Saul never says anything like that. Nobody ever asks him. Um, he had, last week or the week before, we talked about how Samuel, the prophet, just comes into his life and, and, and anoints him. He says, guess what? You're going to be the next king of Israel. And there's no comment from Saul. He's just unsure about all of this stuff. And this is one of the things that we see as we go through this story. And I shared this uh, last Wednesday night, but it's, it's sometimes it's difficult with these uh, biblical stories because they're fairly long. This story of Saul and how he becomes king is three chapters long. And we can't really cover all of that in one setting. And so we're going to take, we, we're going to take three weeks to do all of that, that the Bible goes through in these three chapters. And so we just have to keep reminded of the process that's going through here and what's going on in Saul's mind. So there's a three-step process that we're going to talk about. I brought this up last week and we shared it with you and we've already talked about the first one, which is that anointing by God through Samuel. Again, Saul's out looking for donkeys. He's just wandering the countryside looking for donkeys. He meets up with prophet Saul and our Samuel, and Samuel says, guess what? You're going to be king. And he anoints him with oil, and, but it's a private ceremony. That's the thing to remind. It's just Saul and Samuel. That's it. And then we know from last week that the first time somebody asks you, hey, I, you, know, you, you met with Samuel. What happened, Saul? And Saul says, well, we found the donkeys. <laughs> Didn't even mention the king part, the anointing part. You would think that you would leave with that, right? That would be the big thing. But that's where we're picking up the story. Saul has, or Saul has just said this. And now we're in Samuel chapter 10, starting in verse 17, and we're on the next section here. And it starts off by saying, Samuel summoned the people of Israel. I forgot to mention the other two processes, didn't I? I got so wrapped up in Saul that I forgot to even tell you what was else was on that screen. We're going to, we're going to have a casting of lots, and then we're going to have a military battle. And these are the process by which Saul is going to be king. So now, back to 17. Samuel summoned the people of Israel to the Lord at Mizpah and said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought Israel up out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you have now rejected your God, who saves you out of all your disasters and calamities. And you have said, no, appoint a king over us. So now, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and clans. Samuel, remember from before when the people said we want a king, the first thing Samuel realizes is, and what God says is, is that by asking for a king, they're saying, we don't want you to lead us anymore, God. We want this king to lead us. 
And I like this last part where he says, now present yourself before the Lord. It's sort of like you ask for something, God's going to give it to you, but you know what? You're going to have to face God about this. You're going to have to stand right here and publicly make an affirmation that you are, that you want a king, and that you are now rejecting your God, as Samuel said. There's also something else that's going to go on here. We're going to be casting lots. And it's almost like Samuel anointed Saul, expected Saul to do something, but Saul hasn't done anything. So Samuel, in his wisdom, and Samuel in his place as the prophet and the judge of Israel, he's going to force the issue. He's going to say to Saul, we did it privately, now we're going to do it publicly. And again, Saul hasn't said, yeah, I, I agree to be king. Instead, Samuel's been running the show. So, in verse 20, it says, When Samuel had all Israel come forward by tribes, the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. Now, here's the, the interesting thing is, we really don't know for sure what that meant. What, what does it mean, taken by Lot? Maybe they drew straws, and whoever got the longest straw or shortest straw, it could be some kind of uh, uh, more mystical thing where they... Um, cast dice or something. When I was growing up, when I ever read this, I always thought it was like they rolled dice. And whoever got the highest number got the was chosen by God. It's also very poss possible that they, the high priest had this breastplate, that, and he had there were actually 14 stones on the breastplate. Twelve of them represented the tribes, but then they had these other two that were called the Urim and the Thummim. <laughs> Which is just fun to say. Say Urim and Thummim, just, just so you can say it. <laughs> Most of you didn't even move your lips. Right? Yeah, I didn't even see you there. So, but those are just fun words to say. And apparently, they, they used this with yes or no questions. They would say, so the first tribe would come up, and they would say, uh, is, is God, is Judah the tribe? And one of the lights would come on that indicated yes. So one of the stones would light up that would say yes. So one of the stones would, the other one would come up, which means no. And it's possible that that's what they were doing here. Now, it doesn't say that. It just says they chose them by lot. The point is that it's all from the perspective of people without faith in God. This is total chance. It's random. It seems random. And I think I mentioned it last week, but... You know, if we did if we did things like this today, we would have more fights than you can possibly because most people would say, no, this can't be right. You can't you can't just pick the whole take the whole country and say, we're gonna pick our president by casting lots. So the first thing we're gonna do is all those people in California stand up. Okay, is it is God is the next president from California? And God says yes or no. And he says, no, so they sit down. Then we go to Nevada. We say, is the, you see what happened there? Take 50 states. And at point, some point, someone's going to say, and if you looked at that, you think, well, no, you can't run a country like that, can you? <laughs> well, apparently you can. But it takes most people to actually trust God, that God is going to, that God is in control of these things that things aren't random. Even if they look random to us, they're not random because God is in control. If you get picked, it's because God picked you. Doesn't matter what the process is. And so that's what's going on here. The tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. Then it says, then he brought forward the tribe of Benjamin, clan by clan, and Matri's clan was taken. So there's all these families and clans within the tribe of Benjamin. And so they go by each family and they ask, is this the one? And God says, no. And is this the one? And God says, no. And this and goes on until he gets to this matri guy. And then his family comes forward. And it says, finally, Saul, son of Kish, was taken. So then they took that family and they started going through each individual. You realize that this could have taken like three weeks to go through all of these people until they got to uh, Saul, son of Kish. And at this point, if you're Saul, you're thinking, man, I was really hoping that the Kalat was going to somebody else, <laughs> right? But 
So Samuel anoints, and then maybe his second thought is, I think Samuel's manipulating things just a little bit so that my my lot will be taken, my name will be picked. But the process is one of those things where Israel has to trust that God is in control of this and that God is doing this. Of course, this is what happens. You see the next line. But when they looked for Saul, he was not to be found. You say, well, how did they pick him if he wasn't? When he, when he, and the answer is, no, they went through. They didn't necessarily have to have all the people. In, they just went through the names, like a list. Is it this guy? Is it this guy? Is it this guy? Saul's name, and you can see everybody standing there going, wait, where's Saul? Is this, where's Saul at? Isn't he here? And you kind of question, think about, well, doesn't this kind of indicate that maybe Saul, at the end of the day, isn't really happy about being king? He doesn't know for sure if he wants to do this. Yeah, Samuel anoints him, and then yeah, God shows everybody who's, that he's going to be the king, but Saul is not in place. Verse 22. So they inquired further of the Lord. Has the man come here yet? Maybe he just hasn't got here yet. After all this process, maybe we're just not sure where he is. And the Lord said, he has hidden himself among the supplies. Well, it's like, you know, there, there's a, one of the themes in the Bible is that whenever somebody hides from God, God finds them just like that. He's really good at hide and seek. God just knows who you are. The other thing about this, as we'll, and we'll read this again, is that who's the biggest guy in Israel? Yeah. Saul is. It's like, you know, in verse 23, it says, they ran and brought him out. They wanted to make sure they got there before he hid someplace else. And as he stood among the people, he was a head taller than any of the others. They could have actually done it this way. They could have just said, everybody line up, call us the shorts, or whatever. <laughs> okay, who's the king? There he is. He's the tallest guy. He's a, it's a head taller, if you think about that. You know, you see that in, um, I've seen this on some pictures of, like, high school basketball teams. You'll see everybody's roughly the same height, and then there'll be one guy that's seven feet right. tall right there. And it's just obvious. He can't, literally, he cannot hide, can he? He can't hide. Verse uh, 24, Samuel said to all the people, do you see the man the Lord has chosen? And of course, their answer is, well, yeah, we can't miss him. <laughs> then he says, there is no one like him among all the people. Then all the people shouted, long live the king. There it is. Saul so can't hide anymore. He was anointed by Samuel, and he can keep that a secret, but now it, the secret's out. Everybody knows. And I just think that this, this uh, line in there that Samuel says, there is no one like him among all the people. And you can take that like a half a dozen ways. Yeah. It could mean this guy could be the best thing ever, but it could also mean, hey, he's got some questionable things about him. We're not sure if there's anyone like him. And so this kind of this ambiguous, and, and he says there, do you see the man? And then he doesn't say, you have chosen. He says, the Lord has chosen. And the people say, yeah, long live the king. And the, honestly, there's probably some people in there who feel a little bit of relief, saying, man, it wasn't me. I don't want to lead this ragtag group of tribes that can't get together. Go back to the end of the book of Judges and read the last three or four chapters, and the tribes are just fighting each other all the time. And God says, guess what, Saul? You get to unite these people. You get to bring them together. Which is what we're going to say at some point to the next president of the United States. Guess what? You're going to get to bring all these people together. Let's see how well that works. There's, a, there's an old saying, by the way, that says that anybody who wants to be president of the United States probably shouldn't be. There's a, there's a reality to it that if you really want a job like that, you're probably not fit for it. We would be better off probably just randomly picking somebody. I'm not really advocating for that because it would take forever and I don't think it would solve any of the problems that we think it would solve. So 
We just do the best we can. Verse 25. Samuel explained to the people the rights and duties of king, kingship. He wrote them down on a scroll and deposited it before the Lord. Then Samuel dismissed the people to go to their homes. Now when it says it deposited it before the Lord, there's a pretty good chance that that means they put it either in or with the Ark of the Covenant so that it would be there for you know, the generations. And he talks about these duties and rights of the king. We talked a little bit about the rights of the king before, back in 1 Samuel uh, at chapter 8. And you remember when they asked for a king, Samuel goes through this long list and says, this is what the king's going to do. He's going to do all of these things, and you just have to realize that that's part of being a king. That's what's going to happen with you. But the other part is, it's in Deuteronomy 17. We're not going to go back and look at the, um, we're not going to go back and read it right now. I'm just going to hit the high points, all right? So these are the duties of the king. According to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 17, verses 14 to 20, you can write that down, and then you can go back later this afternoon, and you can read it, and you'll find out that I was right, that this is what it says, okay? And it lists these four things. First it says, not acquire horses from Egypt. Then it says, don't have lots of wives. It says, do have do. And my notes say, not have many wives. So you know what? The person who put this together wrote that, not me. So I don't know what that means. So but it should be, don't have many wives. Do not have many wives. You know, there's a, this, just as I said this, there's a really famous edition way back a couple hundred years ago. Somebody printed out, uh, it was a King James Bible, and when they got to the commandment that says, thou shalt not have, thou shalt not commit adultery, there's a real famous edition where they left out the word not. not. So it, the Bible says in that edition, thou shalt commit adultery. And it's like, it's called the Sinner's Bible, by the way. And if you have a copy of it, you would. It's a lot worth a lot of money anyway, yeah. but um, but that's what this is. Do it's a do not <laughs> do not have any wife. But I, it's my fault because I checked this and I I proofread it and I still missed that. So do not have any wives. Do not accumulate silver and gold. And then it says, the last thing it says, is learn and study God's word. Those are the things the king is supposed to do. And you look at those things a little bit and you kind of go, well, what exactly? Is going on? Well, the last one's easy, right? Learn and study God's word. That makes perfect sense. But what's the thing about horses in Egypt? Part of that is don't look to other countries for military help. Don't buy arms from other countries. Don't buy, that's what horses are. Horses are part of the military. Don't get, don't look to other countries to help you in times of need. The emphasis here is not so much on the horses as it is from Egypt. Okay? What about the wives thing? Well, the reality is kings marry a lot of times because they're making treaties with other countries. And this is why, by the way, you've heard of Solomon, right? You've heard about him, Solomon, and he had all these wives. Well, what most of those were women that were he was married to, to to seal a treaty with another country or deal with uh, uh, another king in some way. So what God is saying is, first of all, don't look to them for help. But secondly, don't make treaties with them. Don't join up with them because it'll, it'll just bring you trouble in the long run. And don't accumulate silver and gold. Don't look at your wealth as a source of power and source of, of, of doing things. Because a king could very easily say, look at me, I'm powerful, I've got treaties with these other countries, I've got military money, I've got wealth, and, got, and God says, don't, those are, you know, fame, compromise, um, looking to military might, those are all things that the king could begin to rely on. And God says, don't do any of those things, instead, study my word, learn my ways, do things the way I want you to. Do what I've called you to do. Be who I've called you to be. 
You are the king, and you will be successful if you do it the way that I am instructing you to do it, if you rely on me. And that's true for any of us. God calls us to certain things, calls us to, to be something, God, to do something. And when God does, he says, God says to us, do it my way. Do it the way that I instruct you to do it, and you will be <laughs> successful. Things will work well. But if you start trusting other people, if you start looking for other places to help, if you start relying on your own abilities, that's when you're going to get into trouble. And that's what God is telling both the people and Saul. Saul, you listen to me, and you'll be good. You'll, you'll be a good king. The country will prosper. Things will go well. And that's an important part of any of us. One of the things that I've been reading several places, um, just random readings that I do from time to time, is this emphasis that, we, that a lot of people are having now that regardless of what happens in our country, regardless of what happens out there, God calls us to do the same things. We do it in our, um, on the front of the bulletin, we have our mission statement, and it says, we will together give glory to God, bring others to Jesus, show love to our community. That's our mission statement. And you know what? It doesn't change. Or it's not supposed to change. It doesn't matter what other people do. It doesn't matter what other churches do. It doesn't matter what's going on out there. It doesn't matter if there are good times or bad times. It doesn't matter if there's trials or if there's blessings. It doesn't matter what's going on around us. Our job as a church is to give glory to God, bring others to Jesus, and show love to our community. And we need to keep doing that regardless of whatever else happens. And that's what God is telling the king here. Regardless of what happens, and something bad is going to happen in just a minute, regardless, you do this. And you keep doing this. And you'll be fine. God says, I'll take care of it. It will be good. I just want to, uh, I also have a, hopefully, uh, there's also the rights of the king, and I'm just going to give, I'm going to broadly take that passage I mentioned early in chapter 8, and what Samuel says there to them, and this is what he says. The rights of the king. The king's going to do two things. Draft people in the military, and tax the people. We could put do rights of the government, and we could put the same stuff up there. So the king is going to do those things, and he's going to have to do those things, but he needs to do those in the way that God wants him to do them. That's the way, that's the way it's going to be. We go forward into all of this stuff. We're going to kind of test some of those things and look at some of the kings and ask ourselves, did they follow these things? Did they do, first of all, did anybody learn and study God's word? That's the most important one. And it doesn't appear that they did. All right. So, Samuel dismissed the people to go to their homes. Verse 26. Saul also went to his home in Gibeah, accompanied by valiant men whose hearts God had touched. But some scoundrels said, How can this fellow save us? They despised him and brought him no gifts. But Saul kept silent. That seems to be a trend so far. Saul doesn't say much. He keeps silent. But isn't it interesting that God has chosen this guy, Samuel has anointed him, and you would think everybody's on his side. And this verse is in there to show us that, guess what? Even when God's in something, even when things are going the way that God wants them, even when we know what God wants, there's always going to be some people who are going to say, I'm not sure this is the right way to go. And that's what Saul faces. So the first two steps in the process are complete. Anointing, then the casting of lots. And at this point, you would think most people, if not everybody, is on board. But apparently that's not true. So we're going to do one more step in the process. Now, we're going to get ready to do chapter 11, and so we're going to go into it right now. But I just have to, uh, one of the interesting things to me is, is the, how we got our Bible and the process by which 
we read the things that are here. And between verse 27 and chapter 11, verse 1, there's just this interesting little thing that goes on. If you have a uh, newer NID, or if you have a New Revised Standard Version, or some of the other more modern versions, there's an extra little section in here that isn't in some of the other translations. And the short thing, uh, the, I could go the long way or the short way, but here's the, here's the primary thing that would happen, is, is that there's this thing called the Masoretic Text. That is the Hebrew text that has been around since the time of Jesus, and the Jewish rabbis have kept it current and kept it, um, kept it accurate all for 2,000 years. And then in the 1940s, there was this discovery called the Dead Sea Scrolls. Maybe you've heard of them. You ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? A couple, three people have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, yeah. Well, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a copy of all the New Testament books from 2,000 years ago, before the time of Christ. Uh, I think the only book that's not in the Dead Sea Scrolls is Esther. That's a whole different thing, just to let you know. In the book of Samuel, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's an extra paragraph between 27 and 11 to 1. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it, is. it is interesting, right? And so, from the last 40 or 50 or 60 years, there's been a big discussion. You know, do we go back to the Dead Sea Scrolls and include this? Or do we just go with what we have? Now, I'm going to read, if you have an NIV, a relatively new NIV, you have this in there. Because I have, in my Bible, there's a footnote down here, and it has it in there. It doesn't put it in the text, because we're not deciding that. But this is what it says. You'll have to listen, because I didn't put it up on the board. But this is what it says. Right after it says, um, they despised him and brought him no gifts, it says, now Nahash, king of the Ammonites, oppressed the Gadites and Reubenites severely. He gouged out all the right eyes and struck terror and dread in Israel. Not a man remained among the Israelites beyond the Jordan whose right eye was not gouged out by Nahash, king of the Ammonites, except that 7,000 men fled from the Ammonites and entered Jabesh Gilead. About a month later, and then it goes into chapter 11, verse 1 that we have, Nahash. Now, the reason why I put that out there is because it's a, a little explanatory note as to why Nahash the Ammonite is actually attacking the town of Jabesh Gilead because he's chasing after these 7,000 soldiers who are hiding there. Okay? Aren't you glad you came to church today? You're all yeah. that? Yeah. Interesting, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's when you, now we're going to chapter 11, verse 1. And it says, Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. And the first question would be, well, why did he do that, right? But the answer is because he's been fighting this war with the, the tribe of Gad and the tribe of Reuben on the other side of the Jordan, and he's been defeating their armies and pretty, don't get captured. Because if you get captured, they're going to gouge out your right eye and do some other things probably. And all the men of Jabesh said to him, make a treaty with us, and we will be subject to you. So the, the people in Jabesh, Gilead, say, yeah, we got these 7,000 people in here, but we're willing to make some kind of treaty with you. We're, gonna, we're willing to give up something, right? So this is the, now, we're going to look at a map. This is the same map I put up, I think, last week. And it's real colorful, that's why I love the map. Yeah. But, so, right down in this area, there's Gibeah, that's where Saul lives. Here's Bethel, here's Jerusalem, Gilgal, Mizpah's right in here, there's Shiloh. This is the area that we've been talking about, right? This is the tribe of Reuben, this is the tribe of Gad, up in here. This is the Ammonites. Everybody remembers where the Ammonites came from, right? I don't have to go back to Genesis and read all of that. Ammon is one of the sons of Lot. That's why, and it's interesting because when the children of Israel came up from Egypt, they came up like this, and then they crossed over, and when they got to the Ammonites, God said, leave the Ammonites alone, because there are lots of descendants, I have given them that land, so you just ignore them, just go on into the promised land, don't fight them. But now, several generations later, 
The Ammonites are attacking Reuben and Gad. And you look at this and you think, well, where's Jabesh Gilead? Right up in this area. It's not on this map because I couldn't find a map that had both the tribes on it and Jabesh Gilead for some reason. But you notice it's, so Reuben and Gad are fighting the Ammonites and they're on the other side of the Jordan River, which is right here. Saul is over here. Jabesh Gilead says, we're in trouble. Everybody else, we're going to read that in a minute. But Gad and Reuben are two tribes that are dealing with the Ammonites. And so the first test of the king is going to be, will he help out these other tribes? Will he be able to get enough people together to fight the Ammonites and protect all of Israel, all 12 tribes, not just Benjamin, which is right here, and Ephraim, and Judah. That's going to be the test. In verse 2, this the Jabesh Gilead said, hey, we'll, we'll give up. Make a treaty with us, Nahash and Nahash. But Nahash the Ammonite replied, I will make a treaty with you only on the condition that I gouge out the right eye of every one of you and so bring disgrace on all Israel. So he says, Nahash says, fine. Everybody line up and we'll just gouge out your right eye and everything will be fine. If you're Jabesh Gilead, is that really a good thing? Are you really going to say that? Verse 3, the elders of Jabesh said to him, Give us seven days so we can send messengers throughout Israel. If no one comes to rescue us, we will surrender to you. Seven days. Not, that's just a week, by the way. Seven days is a week. Doesn't seem like that long. Nahash says, apparently says, Okay, let's do that. Verse 4, when the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul, where Saul was, and reported these terms to the people, they all wept aloud. Just then, Saul was returning from the fields behind his oxen, and he asked, What is wrong with everyone? Why are they weeping? Then they repeated to him what the men of Jabesh had said. Apparently, being king meant you still had to take care of your fields, and plow your fields, and do all the farming, and you didn't, you didn't get to get somebody else to do that. So Saul was still doing what he was doing before taking care of his family farm, his family ranch. And he gets back from the fields, and he says, uh, what's going on? In verse 6, it says, When Saul heard their words, the Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he burned with anger. He took a pair of oxen, cut them into pieces, and sent the pieces by messengers throughout Israel, proclaiming, This is what will be done to the oxen of anyone who does not follow Saul and Samuel. Then the terror of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out together as one. When Saul mustered them at Bezek, the men of Israel numbered 300,000, and those of Judah, 30,000. That's a lot of people. But they apparently recognized Saul as their leader. Saul says, get together, we got to go help our, our other tribe members. we got to go help the Gadites and the Rubenites. Bezik, uh, if you remember the map, is just across the Jordan River from where Jabesh Gilead is. And this is where they all get together. You can't hide 330,000 people, by the way. They're, they're all gathered there. The Ammonites are going to see this. So he mustered them together. In verse 9, it says, They told the messengers from uh, Jabesh Gilead, who had come, Say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, By the time the sun is hot tomorrow, you will be rescued. When the messenger went and reported this to the men of Jabesh, they were elated. And they said to the Ammonites, Tomorrow we will surrender to you, and you can do to us whatever you like. So, Jabesh Gilead then sends this message out to Nahab. And by the way, this is one place where sometimes it would be better if the Bible translators just translated it literally. It says, uh, tomorrow we will surrender to you. Well, you know that's not what they're going to do. Literally, it says, tomorrow we will come out to you. Okay, now that can be taken two ways. It could be taken as a surrender, but it could also be taken as, we're going to come out and fight you. So that's what they said to Nahash. Tomorrow morning, we're going to settle it. We're going to 
take care of all this business. In verse 11, it says, The next day Saul separated his men into three divisions. During the last watch of the night, they broke into the camp of the Ammonites and slaughtered them until the heat of the day. Those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. Completely defeated the Ammonites. Saul has won a victory. Called all these people together. They attack this army. They defeat the army. They drive them back to where they were. And Saul is, has won. So, in verse 12, the people then said to Samuel, Who was it that asked, Shall Saul reign over us? Remember that little part at the end of the previous chapter? Some people said, well, some scoundrel has said, is this the guy who's going to save us? Then it says, turn these men over to us so that we may put them to death. Do not be on the losing side of any argument because this is what will happen. I'll come back to that in a minute. But Saul said, no one will be put to death today. For this day, the Lord has rescued Israel. So Saul has passed his first test. Not only did he lead in victory, but he also shows some grace and mercy to these other people. He doesn't take it out of them. He doesn't say, yeah, you're right. Those guys did, did kind of, they kind of ticked me off by saying that, and now I think we should. We should string them all up. We should gouge out their right eyes, right? Because that would be a, a good way to... But Saul says, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> then verse 14, Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go on to Gilgal, and there renew the kingship. So all the people went to Gilgal and made Saul king in the presence of the Lord. There they sacrificed fellowship offerings before the Lord, and Saul and all the Israelites held a great celebration. Okay, finally, Saul was king. He was anointed, chosen by lot, showed his ability to lead the people, and the people say, we're good. We like this king. We like this whole king thing. See how well it worked out, God? We got the, we, we defeated the enemies, and we everything went good. And at this point, we're looking at Saul and wondering, I'm still wondering, who is this guy really? I mean, is this guy going to be the king we want him to be? One of the things that we, again, a lot of times we, we already know the next part of the story because we've read it before. But when we're reading the story for the first time, the attitude should be, that should be the question. Is Saul really going, I mean, so far he's done some good things, but some things are a little questionable about him. Not sure about this guy, but... Spirit of the Lord came upon him. They defeated the enemies. He was chosen by lot. God has chosen him. And so we should follow him. And now what? I have to come back next week and find out what. <laughs> or, as I say every week, you could read it for yes. yourself and just read ahead. But we have Saul here at this point, at this kind of a crossroad. And there are some things that there are some things that we have to that I'll just take from this. Some some things to consider as we look back over this last few chapters when we think about Saul. And the first is um, there is always a cost to the choices we make, even the right ones. This is uh, this is something that the people have to learn. They want they choosing to have a king. And God says, okay, but you understand that he's going to draft people in the military. You understand he's going to tax you. You understand, you understand that he's going, to, he's going to want the things that you have to support his plans and his policies. and his. You understand that by doing this, even if it's the right choice, it's still going to cost you something. Look at Saul. He could, I guess he could at this point still say, you know what? I'd rather go back and run the farm. I don't want to be king. But he takes it, but apparently he says, no, okay, fine. It's all working that way, so let's, but it's going to cost him something. He's not going to be able to be who he maybe really is in this sense. He's going to be king, whether he likes it or not. See, again, it doesn't appear to anybody ever at this point, nobody has ever said this all. 
Do you want to be king? Now, at this point, it does appear that he said, okay, fine, I'll be king. But it's going to cost him something. It's going to be, just because you're making the right choices, just making the choices that God is even approving, doesn't mean that there isn't some cost here. Even Jesus in the gospel says, you've got to count the cost. You're going out to battle, you better count your men and compare them to the men on the other side. You're going to build a tower? You better make sure you've got the materials and the resources to finish the job. It, you need to consider these things. There's a cost to the things that we choose to do, both positively and negatively. Secondly, there are always some who will work against God's will for you. In Saul's case, he was anointed by Samuel. He was chosen by lots. He was, all those things happened, and guess what? There were still people that said, no, we're not buying it. We're not going, we're not going that way. Which is a real test for us, because um, I'm going to talk politics just for a second, and then I'm going to say amen and run out the door. But um, <laughs> this is what happens, this is what happened in the last election, by the way. We had Christians say, no, we don't, we don't accept that election. We don't think that that was, well, you know what? Tough. That was the decision. That was the choice. You're just going to have to learn to accept it. Or you can be like the people who opposed Saul and be opposite of what God said. Whether I like it or not, that's the way it worked out. Therefore, that's the way God wanted it. Are we willing to say that? I don't like it. I would prefer it be different, but it doesn't matter. Just like these men that either, if God, if God chooses Saul to be king, then my job as a person from Israel is to support the king. Period. Now I'm going, I'm going to the next thing. Just forget, if, if that bothers you, that's okay. Sometimes as a pastor, my job is to poke you a little bit. Third thing. Showing mercy to those who disagree is always a good thing. And that's what Saul does. When he does find out that there are people that don't support his kingship, and other people say, let's, let's cancel them. Best to use the current word rather than the biblical word. Let's cancel them, right? And Saul says, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. We're not going to, we're not going to be that. Going back to what I said earlier, our job is to bring others to Jesus, show love to the community. That means that we treat people who disagree with us with grace and mercy and love. We don't cancel them. We don't put them down. We don't go after them. Instead, we forgive them. We try to reach out our hand and say, join us. Be a part of us. We welcome you. We want to do those things. That's how by the way, as Christians, we are different than the world. That's one of the big problems in our country right now. A lot of there's a lot of problems, but one of the big problems is the real lack of grace and mercy in our country. You disagree with me, I'm taking you down. I'm gonna make you lose, I'm gonna help you lose, I'm gonna help you, I'm gonna to try to get you to lose your job. I'm gonna to try to get you to publicly shame you. I'm going to, and as followers of Christ, people of faith in God, we don't do that. Not we shouldn't do it. We don't do it. Just keep that in mind. The fourth thing is, victories will come to those who follow God's will. You say, well, but that means um, all those other things I just said. There's a cost. There's a, there, we have to show mercy. We have to forgive people. We have, those things can be pretty hard. But you know what? When you do things God's way, we get victories. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. Amen. And so, if we want to be victorious in our lives, we have to be ready to do God's will for us. And God's will is give glory to God, bring others to Jesus, show love to community. Mm -hmm. We just do that, everything else will follow. Mm -hmm. And we can be confident that God will do right by us when we do right by Him. Mm -hmm. Let's pray.